Hi, I'm Andrew Chaikin, and this is the History of Spaceflight and Space Technology. This is uh, week one, and this video will focus on the first artificial satellites of the Soviet Union and the United States, Sputnik and Explorer. The Space Age began on October 4th, 1957, when the Soviet Union fired the first Earth satellite into space. You can see here the headline the next day in the New York Times. The satellite was called Sputnik, and it really was a turning point not only in the history of uh, space technology, but in the psychology of the Cold War and uh, the importance of space in fighting the Cold War, as we will see. Now, what led to this moment? In truth, the, the uh, people in the world who were passionate about space had been thinking about such things for many, many decades, even stretching back to previous centuries. Just to go back to one example, in uh, 1869, an American fiction writer named Edward Everett Hale wrote a story called The Brick Moon that was about a, an artificial satellite, actually a space station with several people living in it that would orbit the Earth and uh, be able to send signals by Morse code. Actually, they would jump up and down on the uh, exterior of the Brick Moon to send these signals. Uh, such was the uh, the space technology envisioned in the latter part of the 19th century. And um, it was just one of many fanciful depictions of, of the idea, the dream, of sending artificial satellites and people into space. Um, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, there were a number of people who were um, leading the way in developing ideas of space exploration. And one of the most prominent was a, um, a physics professor at um, Worcester, Massachusetts, named Robert Hutchings Goddard. Now, Goddard was uh, passionate about space and had had a vision as an 18-year-old boy uh, sitting in a cherry tree um, looking out at the uh, fall uh, leaves of uh, Massachusetts he'd had a vision of being able to construct a, a vehicle that would take people to Mars. I guess he was thinking of himself, really, as the passenger of that ship. But that dream never died in Robert Goddard, and you see him here uh, years later, of course, uh, demonstrating his ideas, sketching out his ideas about something as audacious as traveling from the Earth to the Moon. Now, at that time, in the 1920s, uh, 1930s, um, most people thought that that was just um, worse than fantasy, that it was lunacy, so to speak. And uh, Goddard was uh, ridiculed for his ideas, not only by the public, but in editorial, cartoon, editorial uh, writings, uh, the most well-known example being in the New York Times, where one editorial writer said that any high school student would know that uh, Goddard's idea of using a rocket to go to the moon was impossible because they said uh, the rocket being in a vacuum, in the vacuum of space, would have nothing to push against. Of course, today, high school students are taught that uh, indeed rockets do work in a vacuum, thanks to Newton's law of motion, which states that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. So Goddard was indeed vindicated, and in fact the New York Times published a retraction of their editorial on the day in July 1969 when Apollo 11 lifted off to actually take humans to the surface of the moon. Now Goddard's important contribution to space technology was that he realized that the rockets that had existed uh, up until the uh, first 
decades of the 20th century, which were basically uh, descendants of uh, the ancient skyrockets used by uh, Chinese in centuries past, that these solid fuel rockets, which were basically powered by ver variants of uh, gunpowder, these would not have as much power, not as much energy, as a rocket that was fueled with liquid propellants. And in particular, Goddard, Goddard zeroed in on, um, in one case, alcohol, and in another case, gasoline as the fuel. Most of his rockets actually use gasoline as fuel. And the oxidizer, since you have to carry the oxidizer, the oxygen for burning the fuel along with you since you're leaving the atmosphere, that oxidizer was in fact liquid oxygen. So in liquid form, those propellants would provide more chemical energy and therefore more power to the rocket. And in fact, Robert Goddard invented the first successful liquid fuel rocket, which he launched March 16, 1926, at his Aunt Effie's farm in Auburn, Massachusetts. He um, did receive some support from the Smithsonian Institution and continued his work uh, in New Mexico uh, into the 1940s um, and was uh, working on more advanced rockets. You see him here with some of his co-workers in his workshop in 1940 with a much more substantial rocket. This one even had turbo pumps to uh, deliver the fuel and oxidizer to the combustion chamber. These are all elements that we see even in rockets today. But uh, Goddard had a kind of fatal flaw in his working style that limited his progress. Goddard was a very secretive man. He was mistrustful of others. He was very wary that others would steal his ideas and that he would not receive credit and eventually uh, monetary uh, rewards for patenting his uh, inventions, and so he worked pretty much on his own. He uh, declined offers from other rocket workers and researchers to collaborate, and so his, uh, his progress uh, in rocketry was fairly limited. His inspirational impact today, uh, the impact of his dreams, remains more of a factor than the impact of his technology.